along with the Association of Government Accountants and the Association of Local Government Auditors, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on Uniform Grant Guidelines, Implementation Issues for Management and Auditors. My name is Kenny Pointer and I'm the Executive Director of NASAC and I'll be serving as your host for today's event. We're joined today by approximately 1,500 government accountants and auditors and other interested parties from 100 different locations across the United States. Have you encountered problems implementing the provisions of the U.S. Office of Management and Budget's Uniform Administrative Requirements, Cost Principles, and Audit Requirements for Federal Awards, otherwise known as the Uniform Guidance, or simply the IG or the UG? Are you prepared to conduct your FY16 single audit in accordance with the new UG's provisions? Originally published as a final rule in the Federal Register on December 26th of 2013, Governments and other recipients have been working diligently since that time to understand and implement the myriad of changes contained in the UG. Uh, certainly this has been no small feat, as most of you can attest to, considering the UG repre represented the consolidation and combination of eight, uh, yes, you heard correct, eight existing previous OMB circulars. So this was a significant effort uh, on everyone's part. Today's webinar will provide practical guidance. You know, we've all heard about the contents and the requirements, but how are states implementing, state and local governments and other recipients of federal awards implementing the new UG? Today we're really fortunate to hear from two states, uh, Maine and Virginia, and we'll learn from them on how they've implemented the new requirements of the UG in two primary areas. First, the administrative and management issues, and then secondly, the single audit issues. We're very fortunate to have with us today Doug Cottonar, State Controller of Maine, also Shirley Brown, Deputy State Controller of Maine, and George Strudgeon, Audit Director and Single Audit Coordinator uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And more information on each of our speakers can be found in their complete bios, which were provided to you in advance of today's webinar. Before we get started, let's run through, we need to cover just a few housekeeping matters uh, today we are going to utilize interactive polling to gather your feedback during the presentation. Uh, we've used this feature the past several webinars and the evaluations have been very positive. Also, the interactive polling will be used to verify attendance today for individuals. Uh, note I said individuals, so I think there's about 46 individuals uh, on the line today. For groups, uh, we still want you to participate in the polling, but please answer in a way that reflects the consensus of your group. Attendance for group uh, for groups will still be monitored via the sign-in sheet. Following the presentation, we will have approximately 20 minutes for live questions and answers. Today, we are allowing participants to receive audio through either their computer or their phone. And simply to ask your question, use the raise your hand function of our webinar software. Simply click on the hand icon that's located in the toolbar. And, and just as a reminder, if you are going to ask your question live, using your computer. Uh, your computer must have a microphone for that process to work properly. If you prefer, you can just type your question and go ahead and send it to us at any point during the webinar using the questions tab that's also located in the webinar toolbar on the right hand side of your screen. Again, you can type and submit your question at any point uh, during the webinar. Our speakers today will be using PowerPoint presentations which you should be able to see on your screen and they were provided to you in advance. If you're experiencing any technical problems, please give us a call. Our number here is 859-276-1147. Again, 859-276-1147. Uh, as you can tell, we have a very full agenda today, and I want to express my gratitude to our speakers for taking time from their busy schedules uh, to be with us today and share their knowledge and experience. With that as a brief background, let me turn the program over to our speakers, uh, Doug, Shirley, and George. Welcome to today's webinar, and Doug, I believe you're going to lead us off. That's right, Kenny. Thank you. Good afternoon. As Kenny mentioned, my name is Doug Cottonwar, and I'm the controller for the state of Maine. Now, contrary to what you might have heard, we're not actually part of Canada. We just share some of the same weather. In fact, it snowed about six or seven inches in the northern half of Maine two days ago. Today, though, it's sunny, blue skies, and mid-60s. We actually have a saying in Maine, if you don't like the weather, just stick around a few minutes. It'll change. 
Now, speaking of change, I started out my career in government as an accountant managing grant funds under the provisions of A87, A102, and A110 before the first single audit of the state of Maine was ever conducted. I transitioned into the office of the state auditor to help actually perform that first single audit and continued to audit financials and federal programs for more than a decade. For the past 16 years, however, I've worked in the controller's office developing financial accounting and reporting systems and policies to manage them. So let's get started. Rather than make the assumption that everyone knows what the uniform guidance is, let's just take a quick brief few minutes to go over what's included. The uniform guidance is the compilation of several OMB circulars that have now been codified into Title II, Part 200. These include policies that have worked effectively for many years and some new ground policy perspective. The guidance combines diverse requirements covering a number of subject areas into one overarching law. We won't go through everything that's been included in the guidance, but rather let's quickly identify some of the circulars that are covered by category. First, there are cost principles. These include A21 for educational institutions, A87 for state, local, and Indian tribal governments, and A122 for not -in profits Next, there are uniform administrative requirements, which encompass A102, the common rule, and A110. Then there are audit requirements for federal awards, including A133, which is what applies to states, locals, nonprofits, and higher education. Finally, there are circulars for the federal agencies, including A50, covering audit follow-up for federal executive agencies, and A89, which covers requirements for the CFDA. Hello, everybody. This is Shirley Brown. Yes, we have the uniform guidance now, which is located in Title II CFR 200, as mentioned by Doug. Guidance that resulted from presidential directives to federal awarding agencies, directives to ease administrative burden, and to strengthen oversight. OMB, together with federal awarding agencies, combined the best of the best, inserted repetitive type information into single sources within the guidance, clarified guidance that needed clarifying, revised some of the guidance, and eliminated obsolete guidance. As a matter of fact, the clarification part of this equation is ongoing, and I suspect it will be for years. Now, something that could have been challenging to some, but to date we have not seen it with our state agencies, is the process of locating needed information within the uniform guidance. Using the Electronic Code of Federal Regulations together with the crosswalks that were published prior to the effective date have most likely simplified something that could have been very challenging for some. Now, the effective date for prime recipients applied to new awards made on or after December 26, 2014. On a federal agency by agency basis, the new guidance was also effective for incremental funding issued after that date on grants that existed prior to that date. Each federal agency was responsible for identifying which grants were impacted on an award by award basis. This means we've been operating under the new guidance as well as the old guidance during the transition period for more than a year. This is one of the first challenges that we as a state had to face. We had to talk with our cognizant agencies and grantor agencies to figure out which awards were subject to which guidance. Since many of our grant awards span several years, our program fiscal officers have to read the related terms and conditions every time there's an incremental award or an increase in funding. Yes, that's right. Having an award with incremental funding whereby the original award includes the requirement to follow the associated circulars but the incremental funding includes the requirement to follow the uniform guidance can pose a significant challenge. During November and December of 2014, we provided uniform guidance training to our state agencies. At that time, we recommended creating unique program codes and program periods to help with the issue of identifying incremental funding. All right, thank you, Doug and Shirley, uh, for that introduction. It, it, let's take one uh, polling question at this point in time, and recall we'll have these scattered throughout the presentation. Uh, but the first polling question is very general. Please rate your government's or your entity's preparedness regarding the implementation of the new UG requirements. And please just select one. Do you feel like you're very prepared, prepared, somewhat prepared, or not prepared? And again, no right or wrong answer here. We're just trying to get a sense of our audience. And answering these questions for individuals is also very important because we're using this to 
uh, monitor and attest to your attendance. So we'll give everybody a few seconds and then we'll look at the results. Okay, results coming up now. Uh, Doug and Shirley, you can see the, the majority uh, in somewhat prepared category. 19% very prepared, 32% prepared, and, and uh, again, 47%, the highest answered category at 47%. Only 2% indicate not prepared at all. Great question. That's great. Thank you. So let's talk some more about the challenges that we'll all face when we try to administer subrecipient awards under the new guidance. Specifically, we're going to look at the pre-award risk assessment, communication regarding or communicating required information and data elements, subrecipient performance, including monitoring and reporting, grants management systems, and then the transition period, uh, meaning which awards are subject to which guidance. Now remember at the beginning we said that some of the guidance applies to the feds as well as the states. In this case, the risk assessment considerations found in section 200.205 are new requirements on the federal awarding agencies. The same requirements that apply to the feds under the guidance will also apply to the states when we administer awards to our subrecipients. So how do we go about performing a risk assessment before we make an award decision? This was one of the first challenges our program fiscal officers faced. We need to understand the factors that should influence an agency's decisions about awarding funds. Now, according to the guidance, agencies should review information available through OMB-designated repositories of government-wide eligibility qualification or financial integrity information like SAM and do not pay. We also advised our program fiscal officers to review suspension and debarment regulations in Title II of the CFR. For competitive grants and cooperative agreements, the awarding agency must have a framework in place to evaluate the risks posed by applicants before they receive federal awards. In evaluating risks, the agency can consider such things as the subrecipient's financial stability, the quality of their management systems and their ability to meet the management standards, the subrecipient's history of performance, reports and findings from audits, and the applicant's ability to effectively implement statutory, regulatory, or other requirements imposed on non-federal entities. A challenge for a few of our state agencies has been answering risk assessment related questions never asked of them before by their federal awarding agencies. We have explained to our state agencies that it is the federal agency's responsibility and requirement to ask these questions to complete their risk assessment over the non-federal entity. Sometimes terminology used by federal program contexts to complete this process is not terminology that has been frequently used in the past. Our office has helped a few state agencies bridge the gap between what is being asked and what should be provided. I'd like you to note from the last slide that I said the awarding agency must have a framework in place for evaluating the risks. That's important to note because we approach the exercises just that a framework. Rather than develop a one-size-fits-all checklist, we worked with program fiscal officers to approach this from a principles-based set of policies, essentially a framework to evaluate each subrecipient's risk of noncompliance with federal statutes, regulations, and the terms and conditions of the award. This was our first step toward determining things like the need to impose specific award conditions, which is new under the guidance, or establishing our monitoring requirements before the award is made. Helping the program fiscal officers develop a risk assessment framework proved to be challenging but a very rewarding exercise that's still an ongoing process. It helps to have multiple agencies with varied experience participating in that process. To repeat a little of what Doug has already mentioned, pass-through entities are required to complete risk assessments of their subrecipients. This posed what seemed like both a challenge and an opportunity for the state's Department of Education program people. A challenge in that our Department of Education manages hundreds of subrecipients with most subrecipients in receipt of numerous grants and an opportunity and that it has provided the department with an additional method to evaluate their subrecipient monitoring process associated with audit findings. 
to be proactive over the risk assessment process, our internal audit group began meeting with the department approximately a year ago to develop a risk assessment form. The risk assessment items included on the final form were the result of reading the uniform guidance, numerous meetings, and reviewing what other states were doing for this process. A challenge, challenge during this process was achieving the goal of having an easy-to-use, one-page, comprehensive form that could potentially be used by agents wide. Remember the directive, ease of administrative burden. Recently, Internal Audit met with the department to follow up on whether the risk assessment form was working as intended. To give you a little history, the form as developed addresses a one-to-one -one relationship. It was left to the department to devise a process that would work best for them. This is due to the fact that the majority of subrecipients are school administrative units that receive numerous grants each. To address this issue within the special education program and to ease the burden, the department created an Excel spreadsheet to capture risk assessment criteria such as that on the form that our internal audit group created. The one spreadsheet includes all SAUs or all subrecipients on one page with attributes, attribute questions listed across the top of the sheet. For situations like the Department of Education, where the pass-through entity has hundreds of subs with numerous sub-awards per sub, it could be challenging to develop an efficient method of assessing risk from both the prime and the subrecipient standpoint. You can find the risk assessment requirement at section 200.331. It clearly indicates that a risk assessment is required of each sub-award. So if you have one sub with several sub-awards, remember that each sub-award needs its own risk assessment. Here on slide 10, you will see an example of the original risk assessment form developed by our internal audit group. This is the top portion of the original form, and it provides a section for the score. As I said before, this is not the form that the Department of Education is currently using, since because of the one-to-many relationship of their general subrecipient population, the department developed a process that was most efficient and effective to capture risk assessment information needed for the hundreds of subrecipients and thousands of grants under their administration. Getting back to the original form, there are drop-down boxes that allow you to select an X for the dollar range of the award, the type of accounting system used by the entity, and the program complexity. Here on slide 11, the other half of the form, the questions require a yes and no answer regarding entity risk and reporting and budget. Additionally, there is a section to include a narrative on other issues. If you look closely, the answers indicate that this sub is doing okay, but the sub's risk assessment calculates to be moderate and not low. Let's go back to slide 10 quickly. The items driving the score to be moderate or 95 were dollar amount of the sub award, the fact that the sub has both an automated and a manual accounting system, and the complexity of the program. Back at slide 11, bottom of the form, you will see the ratings for low, moderate, and high risk. The total score automatically calculates based on how questions are answered. Moving forward to slide 12, I know I said this was a one-page form, but this page is informational and includes common attributes of grantees with low, moderate, and high risk characteristics. Another challenge associated with developing a risk assessment form is the subjectivity of the ratings. To our knowledge, a standardized template or form for assessing risk has not been issued to date. The risk assessments are very subjective. Entities can essentially define their ranges for low, moderate, and high risk. But as you refine your risk assessment process, you can revise those ranges to become more consistent. Those revisions can be based on your experience with the subrecipients, audit findings, or program results, for example. So that's our challenge with the risk assessment. The next challenge we faced related to the pass-through entity's responsibilities under Section 200.331 of the guidance, specifically communicating required information and data elements to the subrecipient at the time of the award. According to the guidance, the pass-through entity must ensure that every subaward 
is clearly identified to the subrecipient as a subaward and includes the specific information on the list that you'll see in the next slide. This information should be provided, again, at the time of the subaward. And if any of these data elements change, those changes must also be included in any subsequent award modification. Now, this brings its own inherent challenge. How often do we actually have all this information in a grant? Realistically, it's sometimes hit or miss at best, and that's to be expected. However, that doesn't change our responsibilities under the guidance. Similar to the risk assessment framework, we try not to limit ourselves to a one-size-fits-all checklist. Although this requirement lends itself very well to a checklist approach, there are times when information and data elements are not available. This is when we apply some overarching principles. The governing principle here is when some of this information is not available, the pass-through entity must provide the best information that is available to describe the federal award and the subaward. At the very least, make an effort to be descriptive and included in the documentation. It can be challenging as to how to ensure that this information is included with all subawards. The first item to note here is making the distinction between procurement actions and subaward actions. In a subaward action, there is a subrecipient relationship in which the entity is awarding a grant or cooperative agreement. Now, in Maine, we use a contract-like document to issue and track subrecipient grants and subawards. We use a procurement contract for contractor services. We don't have a standardized form for issuing grants and awards in all programs. Unlike the procurement transaction, for example, where our standard template includes federal requirements like debarment and suspension and drug-free workplace. To address this disparity with grants and awards, we have worked with state agency program fiscal officers to develop the list of required elements that must be communicated. Additionally, we are consulting with our statewide procurement office to determine the feasibility of incorporating additional data elements into standardized subrecipient award templates. All right, thank you, uh, Doug and Shirley. Give you a chance to catch your breath. Uh, the next polling question is, uh, you know, Doug and Shirley have talked a lot about the, the pre-award risk assessment, a new component of the UG. But, but the question is, uh, prior to the uniform guidance, did your government conduct a pre-award risk assessment? And we use government. It could be a not-for-profit, uh, certainly anybody that had a subrecipient. Uh, did you conduct a pre-award risk assessment prior to the uniform guidance? Uh, answer is yes, no, or, or perhaps not applicable to you if you didn't have any subrecipients. Again, we'll give everybody just a few seconds to answer that question, and uh, then we'll turn it back to Doug and Shirley. And just as a reminder, uh, regarding questions, we will have a Q&A session at the end, but if you do have questions as Doug and Shirley and later George go through their presentations, uh, you can go ahead and send those to us, type those in using the questions tab that's located in the webinar toolbar, and just uh, hit submit, and we'll have those in the queue and ready to go during the Q&A. All right, answers coming up now. And uh, not surprisingly, at least to me, 44% said no. You know, prior to uniform guidance, we did not uh, conduct a pre-award risk assessment. Certainly that will change now, given the UG. 23% uh, said yes, uh, they did. And 33% uh, said really this did not apply to them. Uh, I guess in this case, they had no awards that were passed through to subs. So pretty interesting result there, Doug and Shirley. Yes, they are. In fact, congratulations to those that were performing a risk assessment. You're ahead of the game in, in what we're going to talk about here in a second. Now, we've talked about the difference between procurement actions and sub-award actions. The best way to distinguish one from the other is to consider our relationship with the entity that we're paying. Is this, in fact, a subrecipient or is it a contractor? It's been a challenge for years. Uniform guidance doesn't actually change the requirements that have existed in A133 for a couple of decades. What it does do, however, is replace the term vendor with the term contractor. This may seem trivial, but in reality, it changes our perspective when we characterize the relationship. An agreement with a contractor under a grant is a procurement transaction. In essence, we have a buyer and we have a seller. An agreement with a subrecipient, on the other hand, is a subaward transaction. Its purpose is to assist or support another organization in furthering the activities of a federal program. 
there are distinct differences in both the characteristics and requirements around these two relationships. Now we enter into a relationship with a contractor for the purpose of obtaining goods and services for the non-federal entity's own use. As I said, this creates a procurement relationship. A contractor provides goods and services within normal business operations, typically in a competitive environment. Generally, the goods and services aren't directly related to the operation of the program. That is, they're incidental to furthering the activities of the federal program. The guidance really doesn't speak to what type of organization the contractor might be. The nature of the agreement or transaction is what drives the relationship we have. The key thing that I'd like you to keep in mind is that the contractor isn't subject to the compliance requirements of the federal program as a result of the agreement. They may be subjected to similar requirements, however, for other reasons, but they're not as a result of the agreement. It is also challenging in that some people are still referring to contractors as vendors, and our accounting system here at the state of Maine includes a vendor management system that refers to all payees as vendors. On a side note, the requirements for contractor relationships can be found in Appendix 2 of the Uniform Guidance. Now, in contrast, the characteristics of a subrecipient do relate directly to the compliance requirements of the federal program. In this relationship, we have to determine the eligibility and measure performance against program objectives. The subrecipient is, in fact, responsible for adherence to federal program requirements, and we expect them to carry out program activities for the purposes specified in the authorizing statute. A takeaway from this discussion is that it is extremely important to distinguish between contractors and subrecipients. From a program perspective, the substance of the relationship is much more important than the form of the agreement. That challenge is exacerbated by the fact that not all of the characteristics we just discussed are present in all of these cases. Now to address that challenge, we're attempting to standardize the form of the agreements enough here in Maine to ensure that the program fiscal officers can make that determination at the earliest possible stage. Ultimately, it's necessary because the guidance requires the pass-through entity to classify each agreement as a subaward or a procurement contract. In my opinion, the same challenges that existed prior to the uniform guidance regarding the determination of subrecipient versus vendor are still present for circumstances when both characteristics of subrecipient and a contractor exist. Last May, the AGA formed a group with the objective of developing a checklist for this purpose. The checklist titled Recipient Checklist for Determining if an Entity Receiving Funds Has a Contractor or Subrecipient Relationship was finalized last September. With the handouts for today's webinar, you should have received a copy of the AGA checklist. Page 1 of the checklist is currently being shown on slide 20. The fine print is probably difficult to read, so I will tell you that this page provides an overview of the intentions of the checklist, the definitions needed to complete it, and instructions. Moving along to slide 21, you will find pages 2 and 3 of the checklist. The pages here are divided into sections that include a series of yes and no questions. Within each section, that, drive you, that drives you to select either subrecipient or contractor at the end of each section. And, and note, uh, also included on the right-hand side of the checklist are explanations of subrecipient and contractor characteristics related to the individual sections. And at the end of each section, your answers to the questions drive you to selecting either subrecipient or contractor as a conclusion for that section. Page 4 of the checklist is shown on slide 22. This is the last page of the document. Both a full view and a zoomed view are shown on the slide. Within the Zoom view, you may be able to see that it is here that you make a final determination. So what is the final overall determination? The final determination is based on all of the conclusions determined within the prior sections. Unlike the risk assessment form that automatically calculates a risk score, the person completing this form is required to consider all of the conclusions within prior sections to make the final determination. This checklist is a very good example of the type of document that can be used to meet the challenge of determining subrecipient versus contractor. That's an awful lot of discussion around one challenging topic area. So you wonder why is it that important? Well, it's important because it becomes the basis for identifying which relationships are subject to subrecipient monitoring requirements. 
Monitoring is important because that's the pass-through entity's means to ensure the subaward is used for authorized purposes, that the subrecipient activities actually complied with the federal laws, regulations, and terms and conditions of the subaward. And finally, that the sub, and maybe most importantly, the subaward's performance goals were achieved. Additionally, the guidance allows prime recipients to apply special conditions to awards when the subrecipient is considered high risk. For example, we might ask for more supporting documentation or additional reporting from a higher risk subrecipient. Again, with our earlier example of the risk assessment form, the final determination of low, moderate, or high risk not only provides you with a measure as to whether special conditions should be applied to a subaward, but it accomplishes the task of identifying what level of monitoring should be completed. For example, when non-federal entities have hundreds if not thousands of subrecipients and those subrecipients receive on-site monitoring reviews on a rotating schedule of maybe every three or five years, this form could help identify subrecipients that really should be visited on-site annually. All right, thanks Doug and Shirley. One final polling question in this section. Uh, we, we're beginning to talk about subrecipient monitoring now. This question is, as a result of the uniform guidance, have you changed your subrecipient monitoring processes? Simply yes, no, or not applicable. And again, we'll give everybody a few seconds to answer that. All right, answer is coming up now. 33% uh, said yes, we, we in fact have changed our subrecipient monitoring processes as a result of the UG. 14% uh, indicated no, 52% uh, answered NA. So uh, it looks like a lot of people are beginning to change their subrecipient monitoring processes, uh, a key component of the UG. Doug and Shirley, back to you. Thank you. So now comes the big challenge. How does management administer a federal grant program under the new guidance? The primary answer is develop an effective system of financial management. That system should include components that provide adequate accounting for funds, record keeping, and reporting, to name a few. Continually through the year, we work with various program fiscal officers to evaluate their internal control policies and procedures and make recommendations to strengthen and improve them. We also work with them to develop written cash management and cost allowability procedures. The months leading up to the effective date of the new uniform guidance was a challenging period for us in that we wanted to offer a, and provide in-depth training to agencies statewide. With little time and many people to reach, our internal audit group prepared three different two-hour sessions covering a variety of new uniform guidance topics. We conducted each session twice, if not three times, for convenience of our participants. So the question really is, how do you do this as part of your grants management system? Documenting written policies and procedures is essential. This slide speaks to maintaining adequate records in support of grant activities. Shortly after the effective date period, some of our state program people received questions from their federal contacts related to financial management systems or grants management systems. The state agencies asked us basically for a translation of what that meant. The majority of our state agencies perform procedures expected of a financial grants management system, and state and federal auditors review components of these systems as part of their audits. So what does the question mean? Well, do you have a complete financial management system or grants management system documented? What individual components make up that system and how do they work? Who does what and when? The federal program contact is asking for the system in total, not in pieces and not after the fact. They are asking before awarding funds as part of their risk assessment process. Our internal audit group has been busy to say the least. To tackle this challenge, they created a grants management system information document and a grants management system questionnaire. An illustration of page one 
of the six-page document created specifically to provide information over recommendations for a grants management system is shown on slide 27. A page from the grants management system questionnaire is shown on slide 28. This questionnaire was designed to not only provide information to agencies on important components of a system, but to help identify and determine potential areas of strengths and weaknesses. In order to manage our grant accounting and budgetary control, we use grant budget tracking in our ERP accounting system. We employ a budget structure that identifies our grants by CFDA number, grant award number, grant year, and funding profile, as to name just a few. One of the internal controls we use to ensure that these tracking elements are used consistently, for example, is to query our data warehouse for any transactions charged to a federal funding source that doesn't have all of these detailed chart of account elements present. If any are found, our program accountants process adjustments to include those data elements. This makes periodic reconciliation much easier. Internal controls, they can be challenging, especially when implementing newly learned guidance and regulations. The grants management questionnaire includes a few basic internal control questions as shown on slide 30. Also included on slide 30 is section 200.303 of the uniform guidance. The uniform guidance states that internal controls should be in compliance with guidance found in either the Green Book or COSO. But in order to help design an appropriate internal control system, the challenge is in understanding and applying the components and principles of those publications or other internal control guidance available to you. To use what seems like an easy example, the Uniform Guidance Section 200.331 states that pass-through entities must ensure that every subaward is clearly identified to the subrecipient as a subaward and include specific data elements. Internal controls should provide reasonable assurance that the required information will be communicated to subrecipients on the subawards. Internal control guidance can be used to help design policies and procedures for success in achieving that objective. Internal controls around such things as tone at the top, professional development and training of staff, standardization of subaward agreements, and random internal audits of subaward agreements are a few items that could help your entity with this challenge. How do you incorporate written cash management procedures into your system? Slide 31 shows examples of items that should be documented. Additionally, who does what in the process, as I've said before. This should also be documented and updated whenever a change is made. If a pass-through entity is challenged by subrecipients who are not complying with cash management requirements, the uniform guidance can help. For non-compliance issues, the uniform guidance section 200.338 provides remedies for non-compliance. Additionally, Section 200.207, Specific Conditions, also provides for possible solutions when subrecipients fail to comply. This is the last topic area that I will cover, but it's definitely not the least of topics. Your entity should document cost allowability procedures right down to how decisions are made and how differences of, of opinions will be resolved. Subpart E of the Uniform Guidance contains the cost principles. If you have any questions over whether an item is allowable, please contact your cognizant agency or your federal awarding agency for authorization. And if the cost is determined to be allowable, obtain that authorization in writing. Remember, you must obtain prior written approval from the cognizant agency or the federal awarding agency in advance of the incurrence of special or unusual costs. You can find this requirement in section 200.407. What about costs that are listed within cost principles as allowable with conditions? I'll use an example to show why it is important to develop, to develop a documented travel policy. The new guidance at section 200.474 travel costs, paragraph C1 states that temporary dependent care costs above and beyond regular dependent care that directly results from travel to conferences is allowable, provided that the costs are a direct result of the individual travel for the federal award, the costs are consistent with the non-federal entity's documented travel policy for all entity travel, and are only temporary during the travel period. 
Now remember, travel costs for dependents are unallowable, except for travel of duration of six months or more with prior approval of the federal awarding agency. So the state of Maine does have a travel policy that includes principles and requirements. However, the details of administering the policy within each individual state agency should be documented within the agency's internal travel policy. Each agency has unique travel situations that should be defined within their internal travel policy without contradicting the state's overarching policy, of course. But situations like covering dependent care costs while traveling should be outlined within internal travel policies to not only reduce misunderstandings between the employee and the non-federal entity, but to also avoid audit findings and questionable costs. So what does OMB want under the new guidance? Well, as is typical for the feds, pretty much everything. In all seriousness, the goal of the new guidance is to consolidate the requirements into one place to minimize the confusion caused by the different sources of guidance and requirements. Besides standardizing the framework to facilitate proper accounting and full compliance with all the terms and conditions of the various grant programs, the benefit really is refocusing attention on what we and the feds consider important within the programs, and that's getting something done. We've all experienced the situations where when all is said and done, more is said than done. The goal here really is to balance accountability with performance results so that something worthwhile actually gets done. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, since the transition period could last a few years, it'll be important to distinguish which awards are subject to which guidance. If multiple grants, multiple grant years, multiple funding increments, different guidance, all applicable at the same time within the programs. It will be key to provide continual training to existing staff and to develop controls that ensure that new staff is trained in the uniform guidance. With our final slide today, we're providing some links and references to materials that not only explain some of the requirements, but can also be very useful in meeting some of the challenges that we discussed today. Thank you for listening. Doug and Shirley, thank you so much. Uh, great overview of some of the administrative and management challenges of the new uniform guidance uh, and how you guys in your state have handled those. So thank you for that uh, outstanding presentation, really giving, giving us some practical tools and some advice. Uh, next up, uh, of course, we have George Strudgeon and George, the audit director and uh, the single audit uh, coordinator with the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, George is going to talk about single audit issues, of course, subpart F. George. Hey, Kenny. Good afternoon. Can you hear me all right? Just perfect. All right, great. I'll go ahead and get started. Like Kenny said, my name is George Strudgeon. I'm with the auditor's office here in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, today, I, I want to talk to you uh, about some of the differences between A133 and UG uh, for major program determination. I'm going to cover uh, two of them for type A programs. And then, as you know, auditors also are required to look at those uh, smaller type A uh, programs called type B programs and also doing a risk assessment there. So I wanna, we're going to talk about some of the differences about those today, both the A and the B, just a few. Then we're going to learn about a potential uh, solution for adjusting the timing of testing of major programs for the type A programs because what you'll see is that with the selection of type A programs, as Shirley had mentioned, one of the uh, objectives of UG was to reduce administrative burden and so one of those uh, requirements worked its way one of those um, the one of the methods they're using to reduce that administrative burden is in the way the auditor select type A programs and then, and then last but not least um, I learn a solution for ensuring that audit documentation is consistent with UG requirements for tech, uh, selecting type B programs there used to be a cap on how many type B programs you were required to audit, but they've uh, kind of uh, changed the terminology there and it's in a different spot. And if you don't look out for it, it could end up causing new issues and uh, somebody doing a quality control review in your audit in the future. So I just want to cover uh, one solution for the type B programs. Well, let's go ahead and look at those um, things that independently create a high risk type A program and uh, specifically looking at items underneath A133 and UG. 
we have a, a significant deficiency in internal control. So remember, those are things that you want to bring, that the auditor wants to bring to those uh, charged with governance. May, will not necessarily cause a modified opinion on the program, but if the auditor finds that somebody uh, did not um, do uh, their due diligence on something, didn't do uh, maybe everything that they were expected to do underneath uh, subrecipient monitoring, what what would that cause? And right now, underneath A133, that would have been the, the sole criteria that could have caused a Type A program that is audited in one year to automatically be labeled as a high-risk program the following year and required then an audit. So not only is the audit follow-up for the audit finding, but also the rain or test the remaining items. So for example, if you had the subrecipient finding and you'd have to do the follow-up in that area, but also if you had the 12 other requirements you had to test for the program, you would then have to test those additionally. And so underneath UG, the change there is a significant deficiency in internal control is not an automatic uh, creation of a high-risk type A program. Thought being there is that the auditor would have to go in and do the follow-up on the specific item that was mentioned in the finding or created the finding to see if management has taking appropriate corrective action and has addressed the issue. but under, So you still have to do that as an auditor, but you don't have to go and then test the remaining items of the uh, compliance requirements that would be applicable and material to the program. But then, so that's the significant deficiency in internal control. So you can see that the slight switch there, and we'll talk about the impact that we'll have in a later slide. The other change that was made was the auditors being able to use the inherent risk of the federal program to cause a program to be a high risk type A. So they, that was what the auditor could do. And as all the auditors know on the line, A133 would allow you, if you're in a situation where you felt like the, the, risk, the program was inherently risky at, the, uh, at your client or your auditee, then you could go ahead and use your auditor judgment and pick it up again as a major program, uh, causing it potentially to always be in a, a major program every single year. Uh, right now, so underneath UG, what, what now will occur is that the auditor, that ability to use inherent risk to select a type A program and deem it high risk is no longer there for the auditor to use underneath UG. Uh, feds can still pick a high risk program like they have with Medicaid. And so that option is still exists and there's even the option with inside of UG for federal government and pass through entities uh, at 180 days before fiscal year end to ask an auditee to inquiry of their auditor if a program will be selected as a major program. And if not, then at the, uh, the federal government or the pastor entity may request that the program then be um, selected as a major program. And the uh, federal government, the UG is written, is that the federal government or the pastor entity would then bear the burden the financial burden associated with that additional program. So, so that's in there as well. But Anyways, long story short is, uh, for this slide, significant deficiency in internal controls doesn't automatically make a type A program high risk the following year, and no longer are auditors allowed to uh, evaluate the inherent risk of a program and deem it high risk and pick it up as a major program. So if you kind of run some analysis here, and I did this almost a year ago when the Federal Audit Clearinghouse was down. I kind of started running the numbers for our own state here in Virginia, then I, I reached out to a few other states just to see if what I was seeing was, was true. And if you kind of have a, a large, uh, you know, a state with a large portfolio of grants or, or a large uh, municipality or locality, if you kind of run these assumptions, and I did it here for four states, but the assumptions are this. Um, and there's no changes or exceptions to the uniform guidance. So if you have to implement it as it's written, 
on paper, okay, and, and no one says you can do something different, how, what, what would it look like? And assume that you're at an entity that it's fairly decent in managing grants. Sounds like uh, Maine is, is doing a good job up there. So let's just say that they have uh, no material weaknesses in any of their programs. Um, they have no question cost in any one of those programs exceeding 5%. Uh, no modified opinions on any of their type A programs. Also, uh, no uh, changes in systems affecting the program. So if your eligibility system was consistent from year to year and you, and you don't implement a new one or your uh, accounting system or, or anything that would have a, a material and direct impact on the program, if that doesn't change, uh, what, let's just assume though there are no changes in system and there are no changes in personnel affecting the program, I would imagine that one would actually be quite hard for a large type A program that you could have such significant turnover in personnel that would actually elevate the risk of the program, but let, let's go ahead and assume that doesn't happen. Uh, there's no significant problems uh, disclosed by the federal awarding agency. So HHS comes down to Virginia or transportation goes up there to Maine and, and they don't find any issues. Let's just go ahead and assume those. And there's no additional programs needed to uh, meet the percentage of coverage rule, which the UG actually reduced. So for a high risk entity, the auditor needs to audit major programs. Uh, it, equivalent to 40% of their CIFA, and for our low-risk oddity, it's 20%. Uh, I know in Virginia, we pick up the Medicaid program and then another billion-dollar program, and we've, we've met the coverage for the 40% uh, if we're in a high-risk uh, category one year, and if we're low-risk, really, if we just pick up the Medicaid program, we're good. So let's just assume that, that you don't have to pick up anything. Uh, and all my assumptions here are what's in the UG that would now uh, flip a type A program into being material the following year having to be picked up as a type as a high risk as a major program. So what did that what does that look like right now in, in 2015? You have to remember this is only a couple states I reached out to and you've averaged out what we're currently doing right now underneath A133. We're at 24 uh, type A programs and then five type B programs because we are expected to audit some of those currently and we still do underneath UG but I just want to point this out. So this is where we're at. And uh, so what would it look like the next year in 2016 underneath UG and we talk about that reduced administrative burden and the way they designed it. All of a sudden now you're going to get a great reduction because no longer our programs automatically being picked up every year for just a significant deficiency in internal control, just you know, poor documentation in one area. Not enough to modify the opinion, not a material uh, weakness, but just just enough that you want to, if it's large enough that you want to notify those charged with governance, you would then have this decrease in 2016. Okay, you're like, okay, well, you, you must be working. It's meeting that objective. But what happens here when you run out the numbers in 2017? So that's year two of implementation. So in year two of implementation, you're pretty much consistent running these numbers. Now 2018, for those who've read the UG, you also know that's the same year as the single audit study that will be done. And you also, all the auditors out there know of a rule called the two-year look-back rule. So if you haven't audited a type A program in two years, it's then automatically high risk. And what happens is you, your type A's, you have to look back to what was happening in 2015. And so there you, you get the, the large uptick in, in expected workload and the number of type A programs. B's kind of go along with the, the, the formula with the, you have to make sure you audit one for it. So they, the, at least they'll go down in 18. But again, that 2018, that's the year that the single audit profession will be underneath scrutiny as the federal government conducts its study of uh, similar to the study they did back in 2007. Um, so anyways, that's, that's where we are right now. And, and so it would be nice if you could underneath the UG if you kind of take away those numbers and you say, well, in 2018, 
only reason I'm waiting to 2018 is because of that two-year look-back rule. It's not that all of a sudden in 2018 they're of higher risk or they all of a sudden ended up with a material weakness. It's just the way the math works. So one solution that could potentially work is something to, call, to allow for smoothing in the first three years of implementation where you take some of those low-risk type A's that don't become high risk into year three and then you move them and out of 2018 and back into either 16 or into 2017. So that that was a, a policy solution that's been offered up. And so I'll, I'll run through um, what what is um, currently in the progress and in, in process. So for as far as smoothing, so this issue was presented during at the fall 2015 uh, single audit roundtable. So if you don't know. Uh, the National State Auditors Association is represented there. Uh, all the large uh, audit firms are represented there, and OMB and all the oversight agencies for audit at the federal level and, and so forth. And they talk about single audit issues. And this one was, was brought up and first discussed at, in fall of 2015. Um, a solution was discussed at the spring 2016 single audit round table and the solution was this idea of smoothing it. There are some type A risk type A's that maybe auditors should be able to move them out of 18 and either in the 16 or in the 17. OMB to agreed to consider the solution but they they wanted to see if they could get it out for the fall 2016 frequently asked questions document. That's a document that's on the COFAR website. So if you're interested in you know, why did they dis why does part 200 not include a definition for vendor? Well, you can actually go to that document and see that oh, well, vendor contractor actually equals vendor from the old terminology and other things in there like the difference between should and must. Uh, so if you go back to the 303 uh, slide that uh, Shirley talked about, 303, the section of UG. It says you must have a system of internal controls. That's a mandatory requirement. And then should define there. It should match up to either Green Book or COSO. That should is an indication of a best practice. So anyways, it's different terminology than what an auditor is used. So anyways, long story short, they were going to put it into the fall FAQ. But as many auditors know, at large entities, you've already selected your type A programs for next year and have made even have started field work and preliminary work. It didn't seem like a good way of going about getting a solution. Uh, so OMB requested that the National State Auditors Association write a letter to OMB uh, requesting that uh, that be allowed during the first three years of implementation. The other idea justification for allowing it in the first three years of implementation, if you go back to the, that graph, think about that graph, if your workload decreased for that much during those two years, it's hard to maintain the quality of the staff and expertise in-house to be able to conduct the workload that would be coming in 2018. So I believe the federal government does have a vested interest in allowing smoothing in the first three years of implementation to allow for success of the UG. So Friday, uh, May 6, 2016, uh, the National State Auditor Association sent a letter to OMB requesting the smoothing. Uh, that was sent out. And then also OMB received a draft FAQ to allow for smoothing. It was both the answer, or the question and the answer, I guess, was set out there with that kind of policy statement. So I know all the auditors that are listening out there are asking, well, do auditors have permission to smooth major programs? And the answer is to be determined at this point. Uh, nothing official has been received that I'm aware of uh, out of OMB, COFAR, uh, stating that it is allowable. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there that it's kind of an issue that's out there uh, for the community we'll need to address and that um, hopefully we'll get some guidance. But I'll go ahead and uh, I think we have a polling question now. Yeah, thanks, George. I'm, uh, I'm glad you brought this issue about smoothing to, to everyone's attention. You know, it's one of these things where you read the uniform guidance. We, we all read these uh, draft, various drafts before it was finally approved. And, you know, we think we're reducing burden. And, and as your illustration pointed out, we do. 
you know, we, we reduce burden in uh, the first two years, but then due to the look back rule, we really get uh, kind of caught and hammered in, in year three. So I'm glad you brought this to everybody's attention. I, I think most people on the phone are aware, but uh, let's look at this question. Do you believe there will be any unintended consequences uh, if auditors are allowed to smooth low risk type A major programs? You know, we've, we've thought about this a lot, and, and are there unintended consequences out there that we, perhaps we haven't uh, realized? We don't think there are, but uh, let's see what our audience says. We'll give everybody just a few minutes, uh, to, a few seconds uh, to answer this particular question. While we're waiting, uh, George, one of the things uh, you not address, but uh, the other part about this smoothing is we wanted to make sure that that we're allowed to charge the audit cost. Uh, if if in fact we are allowed to smooth these type A major programs over a three-year period, we want those audit costs to be allowed, and that's the other part of the FAQ. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Kenny, because that that's important. If the uh, the federal government is going to get the benefit of the audit services in the first three years, granted it's not in year 18, but if they even if they occur in 16 or 17, they are still getting the benefit of those audits and those opinions. And so, yeah, part of the FAQ that was presented, part of this policy solution was, well, then you also need to make those an allowable audit cost. Um, right, right. And, and we're looking at the results of our polling question now. 42% uh, uh, said yes, they do believe there might be some unintended consequences. 58% uh, answered no. So a little, little closer there than I uh, anticipated. Huh. That's, that's pretty interesting. I, it, I'm sure that you have the ability to communicate to the people on the line, but if they have a specific... Um, Unintended consequence. Yeah, something that we hadn't even thought about. That'd be great to know because um, I believe that may be in the works, but it's not a done deal yet. Yeah, so for those of you that answered that there are some unintended consequences, please let us know, you know how you see that. And, and uh, I think you have the capability to type those in. Uh, and shoot them to us. Uh, we'd, we'd love to know what you uh, see in terms of unintended consequences because, as George mentioned, this is moving along uh, fairly quickly and, and really the timing needs to be enhanced and moved along quickly uh, because auditors are planning their testing for FY16 audits now. Okay. George, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Kenny. Uh, okay, so we talked at the beginning. I talked about uh, I was going to talk about Type A programs, uh, significant deficiencies, no longer being an automatic high risk entity, creating a high risk, sorry, high risk Type A program. Now I'm going to go into the inherent risk of federal uh, programs and, and what issue has occurred. So w remember back from the original slide is it used to be that an auditor could at their own discretion, consider the inherent risk of the federal program and deem a, a program high risk, a type A program high risk, and then bring it in for testing. So this question kind of came up and you have to look at it not at a individual entity, but what does that mean for a program? And so if you look at the Federal Audit Clearinghouse and you just pull out the uh, one program, uh, the Student Financial Assistance Program, uh, 29 states uh, reported on their statewide CFA. Uh, some states, I know like California, they do what's referred to as a series of single audits to meet the audit requirements. So their uh, university systems have their own standalone single audit with their own single uh, CFAs that then have that information. But if you just went out and you, you looked at the uh, Federal Audit Clearinghouse, what is in um, the CFA, what is that, the big large CIFA that you think about it. If you pull it down for each year, just to give you an idea, if you've never done it, it's about uh, 500,000 ro rows of information. So if you looked at it over the last year, uh, 29 states reported uh, it on their statewide CIFAs. Of those, so if you get multiple years worth of information, 22 of the 29 states audited student financial assistance annually. So that means that every year on their uh, data collection form, they are indicating that they are auditing student financial assistance every year as a major program. Um, so it could be that they ended up with significant deficiencies or, or something, but of all the 22 states that audited it, 
uh, three reported a modified opinion on their student financial assistance. So that means that the other ones that are auditing it every year, they're, they're either using the significant deficiency or the auditors are just deeming it uh, high risk be and in inherently risky program at their entity. So that means that there are using UG, it means there's 19 of the 22 states in theory would not be able to use inherent risk to justify auditing student financial aid assistance annually. And so, so what would that look like if you just projected it out? Well, you get six of the 29 states in 2016 picking it up as a major program because of the look back rule of when it was last audited or they were one of those three states that reported a modified opinion on the um, on the student financial assistance cluster. Uh, so you, that's what you end up in 16. And then in 17, you get three states uh, that would pick it up as a major program. And then again, you start seeing that spike occurring in 2018 that uh, would come about when the two-year look-back rule is applied. So this assumes that the way UG is written, and, audit, and there's nothing else that I'm aware of right now that requires uh, student financial assistance to be audited as a major program every year. If you just follow UG as written, uh, this is what our analysis is showing when we pulled down um, all the CFAs for the states and then started analyzing what was going on there. And so I'm just kind of curious, and I think the next polling question is, uh, related to uh, what do auditors need to pick up every year? Yeah, thanks, George. Let's go to that polling question now. Uh, of course, we know Medicaid, but other than Medicaid, do you know of any requirement to annually audit a specific program as a major program or to conduct a some type of compliance audit of that program? Uh, we're trying to really identify, you know, are there any other requirements similar to Medicaid where we have to test those as major uh, each and every year. And just simply select yes or no. I think we'll give everybody just a few seconds and then we'll look at the results. All right, looks like our results are coming up now. Uh, and George, kind of as I expected, 88% uh, said no, they're not aware uh, of another program other than Medicaid. However, there are 12% that said they are aware of another program that's uh, required to be tested annually as major or some other type of compliance audit on that particular program. So again, similar to our last question, if uh, those 12% of you uh, would like to let us know what those programs are, we, we sure would be interested. So uh, please type those in and send it to us. Back to you, George. Yeah, thanks. That's great. I, I'm really interested to know, interested to learn uh, which programs that they're uh, referring to because I don't want to sit here and think that I've done all this planning for next year's major programs and I'm missing something that is required a, and it specifically requires it to be picked up as a major program. That, that'd be great. So yeah, uh, very timely. All right, so discovering if you have implementation issues from an audit standpoint as well as your, your work plan. And so this work plan development and what you have to do is, I'm really suggesting is don't just project what you have to pick up next year as major programs. Do the next three years. Look out and, and, and see if you end up with a blip or a bubble in 2018. Um, whether you, um, if, and also when you do this, uh, project using the UG as written. Uh, presume that past practices, uh, don't assume that past practices are permissible. So if you've always just gone, oh, well, we've always audited the ABC program every single year. Why, why, really question yourself on why do you audit that every single year? I, so I know there's Medicaid out there, which is specifically listed in the compliance supplement, but see what, if you really, if you follow UG as um, written, uh, what do you end up with? 
in over the next three years as far as your major programs. And also, I know I've done a lot of talk here and discussion about the number of programs, the number of programs, but really those hours take, uh, those programs take hours, and those hours take people to get done. So not only look at the number of major programs, but look at the hours needed for each major program. And just don't assume, uh, oh, it's 250 hours for each program. And so what I'm going to share with you now is a analysis we did here. And you kind of have to follow along. We have the program or cluster name, and those are all our type A's here. And then we have the next column going from left to right is the estimated hours when a major program to the nearest 50. So I had sent this out and just said, okay, how many hours do you think you're going to need? And when it is a major program, and so when it when it is a major program, things like financial assistance programs that, that obviously is a very large number. And the reason why, if, if you're seeing that, is because in Virginia we administer that program at 39 separate individual uh, locations because of both the uh, four-year schools and the community college system. So it goes from uh, almost nearly 3,000 then down to zero when it is not a major program. But you can see is that some things don't drop off that much. So for example, unemployment insurance, which is the third line down, it is its own opinion unit in the CAFR, so we still need to do uh, enough work out there over compliance because, uh, if you remember, UG references the GAGA standards and the GAGA standards then reference the AICPA standards. And that those standards still require that you test compliance that have a material, um, that could materially impact the amounts on the financial statement. So if you think about some of your large programs like, um, well, unemployment insurance, all of that is federal dollars, so there's a lot of compliance work that still needs to get done. So there's really only the differential there is what the saving. That's where you get the 550 from. When it's not a major program, we can reduce our budget by 550 hours. So there's things such as reporting or um, various other things that we don't need to test to, because we're not issuing an opinion on compliance. We're still issuing an opinion on their financial statements, but not necessarily on compliance with all 12, app, with those 12 applicable compliance requirements. And then all the way down at the very bottom, you can see Medicaid cluster, because there is no difference between the year that it is a major program or not, it is still it's zero, and that's the math. So you have you have the program going from left and right. The program, the estimated hours when it is a major program, uh, the hours when it's not a major program. Some things still require us to do a lot of work, like unemployment insurance. And then some of them actually drop down to zero because they are not material to any of the financial statements of the Commonwealth. And then you'll end up with the math. And so what we did was to try to figure out, OK, so we balanced out our workload. You notice that there are ones. So the way this worksheet is designed is that when you place a one underneath the fiscal year, it then sums, does the math between the difference and then sums up. And in the very top row are the additional hour needed to test federal compliance and internal controls for major programs by each year. And we started, and what this got us into realizing was that some programs just take a lot more hours than others, such as uh, student financial assistance and research and development. And actually, student financial assistance was so large, we couldn't put all of our hours into 2018. We've actually designed it so about 20% when we do our test work in 17, we'll, we'll just right there at the very end of the fiscal year, we'll do interim work in preparation to issue an opinion and do final work in 18. I guess do final work, then issue the opinion. And so this is the type of analysis I would suggest that other auditor shops do to really look and not only balance out the number of your major programs each year 
but also the hours so you can manage your staffing to ensure a high quality. Because in 2018 will be the year that you have to do, um, you'll be subject to the single audit study underneath the UG. So I just kind of share this for discussion purposes today, just so you kind of know of one way of, of analyzing this information. So that's the end of, of type A, but let's talk about type Bs. And so um, there are there's two things. You think about there's a cap on assessing the risk of type B programs because they can take a lot of work. I think at one time using the old numbers we had 56 type B programs that we had to do risk assessments here in Virginia. So that that's important to know. Like how many how many type B programs do I need to perform risk assessments on? And then also the requirement for testing type B programs. So once I do my risk assessments, truly how many type Bs do I have to to then uh, conduct an audit of and, and do the testing. So underneath A133, the auditor is not required to identify more high-risk type B programs than the number of low-risk A programs. So that basically says is if, if you have, um, keep some nice round numbers here, if you had 20, keep it nice and even, 20, you only had to then do enough to identify, um, to find 20 high-risk type Bs. But then underneath UG, they, they have put it, changed it a little bit and said the auditor is not required to identify more high-risk type B programs than one-fourth the number of low-risk A programs identified as low-risk. So underneath the example, if you had 20 uh, low-risk type A programs, one-fourth of that is five. So you are then capped at only identifying five high-risk type B programs. So try and keep that in mind. So both of them had a cap on the number of risk assessments you needed to perform. But let's go talk about the next part of major program determination requirement for testing type B programs. Underneath A133, it does not require the auditor to to audit more high-risk B programs than the number of low-risk type A programs. So in my scenario, you are capped then at 20. It, you know, so you, that, that was your cap. You, you couldn't test, you weren't expected to test any more than equal to the number of low-risk type A programs. Underneath UG, they've changed it, and now the requirement is to test all type B programs as identified as high-risk. What they did was they put the cap at the risk assessment level, which would in fact lower our administrative burden. So in the example, if I ran the math for one year and I went, okay, we need, we have 56 type B programs, um, but we need to only identify four of them as high risk Bs, four high risk Bs, then when I'm doing my risk assessment and I reach the fourth one, I technically could, I should actually stop my risk assessment process because I've already identified my the four of them that I will audit as a high risk B program. If if I was to keep continuing the risk assessment process and, and spend those resources to do that and I identify additional high-risk B programs, the UG would then require me to test each one of the additional ones I've tested. So while I may be capped at four in doing my risk assessment, if I keep learning and more and more information and I come in and I go, okay, well, I found eight high-risk Bs, I'm now obligated, the Commonwealth of Virginia, to audit uh, eight uh, type B programs. And that would be in addition to the type A programs we're already obligated to test. So it's it's one of those things. The cap used to be uh, on both sides, used to be uh, in both the uh, t risk assessment and in the uh, number that you were required to test. But now it's only at the risk assessment level. And so uh, to mitigate our risk, um, erroneously uh, calling something high risk that isn't or creating that additional burden, that isn't uh, required by the UG, we're only going to have one official location uh, for where we are going to do our type B risk assessments and where we are going to document 
which ones we are deemed high risk. There, there's no um, work paper out there that we have that we will consider an official version. There's only one official version uh, that we will use. And then the other uh, thing that we're going to do, and even in our terminology and, and risk assessments, so if somebody fills out a form, it the, and they say, oh, the federal government came down here and they found issues at this type B program, we would say that, well, that's an indication of higher uh, risk type B program and is not a high risk type B program. It, I know it's semantics, but where I want to try to protect our the uh, audit profession and myself is having to do additional work that isn't required underneath the UG or not doing the work and then somebody uh, claiming that we have uh, poor audit quality. And so we are, we are, that's how we are going to do it. Our risk assessments for type B programs will only be housed in one location. Any questions related to um, what field auditors think about a type B program as we accumulate that information to do the central uh, risk assessment will phrase everything as is this an indication of a higher risk type B program and only in one location will we actually designate something as a high risk type B program. And that is it for me, Kenny. All right, George, thank you very much. I'm glad you brought up that high risk uh, type B analysis because I think that is catching a few audit uh, auditors around the country off guard. I mean, if you risk assess type Bs and you determine that high eight are high risk type Bs, then according to the UG, you have to test all eight of those as major. So I'm glad you brought that up and gave a good illustration. I'm glad you also gave us an idea of how in your office you're going to control that because I think that is catching some people uh, by surprise. So uh, thank you. Um, uh, all of our pre presenters, we are now at the uh, point of the program for the Q&A. And again, I, I encourage you to ask any questions you might have. We've got uh, Doug and Shirley on the administrative and the management side. We've got uh, George to talk about the single audit issues. Uh, really good expertise here with us today. So any issues you are having in your state or your locality or your not-for-profit uh, that, that relates to the UG, this is a great time to ask those questions. Just a refresher on the, the logistics to do that, uh, we are allowing uh, you to ask your question live. If you'd like to do that, uh, simply use the raise your hand function of our webinar software and you can uh, uh, simply click on the hand icon that's located in the toolbar. Uh, if you prefer, uh, and most of you do it this way, you can simply type your question in using the questions tab, also located in the webinar toolbar on the right hand side of your screen. Just simply type in your question and submit it uh, and, and then we'll bring those out in the order in which they are received. So again, please uh, go ahead and submit your questions at this time. While we wait, uh, while we wait for some to come in, let me let me start out with just a few. Uh, Doug and Shirley, let me go back to you. Uh, you know, one of the things we didn't talk about a lot, but it is new in the uh, Uniform Grant Guidance, and that's the the whole idea of the 10 percent de minimis indirect cost rate. Uh, I'm I'm interested about your experience uh, in Maine regarding the 10 percent de minimis. Um, you know, are, are some uh, uh, entities, subrecipients using that? Uh, and specifically the question, you know, is it acceptable to use the 10 percent de minimis cost rate in lieu of a negotiated indirect cost rate? So if you'll answer that question for us and then maybe just give us a little bit about your perspective around the 10 de, uh, the 10 percent de minimis indirect cost rate. Is it actually being used? That's a, that's a good question, Kenny. Actually, you know, we, uh, we brought in uh, an outside vendor to come in and, and talk indirect costs with our program fiscal officers, both on the state and the federal side. Um, the question that was asked very directly is, can we, you know, when we have a negotiated rate that's somewhere below the 10 percent, can we just adjust to the 10 percent de minimis rate under the uniform guidance and use that? Um, the answer we were given very clearly was no. Once you have a negotiated rate, you have to you have to use that negotiated indirect rate. Uh, you can't you can't raise or move to the de minimis 10% rate. Now Shirley's got a little bit uh, of experience with some of the educational institutions, uh, as she mentioned in the presentation, talking with the education program folks. 
Um, I think she's got some first-hand experience with uh, some things that they've been doing with indirect cost rates. Well, right when the uniform guidance came out, the school systems were asking about being able to have indirect cost rates. So at the time, the department was going to um, look for a vendor that could help the school systems and try to determine whether or not that was feasible and what the rate would actually be. I'm not sure what happened with that. I'll have to do some follow-up. But I don't know firsthand if anybody's actually using the de minimis rate at this point in the process. Yeah. Most of them were looking at what, whether a, a, a negotiated rate, you know, trying to do some work on their own to determine if a negotiated rate might actually put them in a better position. Again, the challenge here with the indirect cost really is um, most programs and a lot of education programs don't want to spend a whole lot of money on indirect. They want to use as much money as possible for the program purposes. So keeping the indirect cost rate down as much as possible um, is, is good. Some of the programs have higher indirect cost rates. And again, we, to make the point, if they have a negotiated rate that's higher than that, they can choose to use a lower rate because they can always, they don't have to bill the feds for the full amount of what's on there. What we can't do as a grant administrator, though, is compel a subrecipient to use a lower rate or a rate lower than the, than the negotiated rate. Um, it has to be an optional item. We can't tell them, no, we don't want to spend it on the program. You have to use the de minimis, de minimis rate if you've already got a negotiated cost rate. Thank you. I appreciate you, uh, Claire. I think there's been a lot of uh, confusion around that, uh, surprisingly, but I think it's been out there. Uh, Doug and Shirley, let me stay with you. Um, question from the audience, uh, still around indirect cost rates. It, it goes like this. Uh, if a local government has a cost allocation plan and not a negotiated rate, can departments use the de minimis rate instead of the rate calculated using the cost allocation plan? So if I understand the question correctly, they've, they've done some internal work to develop a cost allocation plan, but they have not, in fact, negotiated with uh, their cognizant agency or HHS Division of Cost Allocation to get an approved indirect cost rate with their grant programs. If that's the case, to my knowledge, they could use the de minimis rate. It's, the guidance really only speaks to if they have a negotiated indirect cost rate uh, with the Fed. Yeah, okay, very good. Uh, looks like we have another question here around indirect costs. I'm going to stay with this just for a second. Let's see if we can. Um, the question is: Are there are any other states using indirect cost rate against the National Guard Bureau? I, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. Doug or Shirley, are you? I'm not. I, unfortunately, I don't know firsthand if our NGB is using an indirect cost rate. Yeah, I'm not either. All right, uh, George, let me switch gears. And uh, we've got several questions here about type A, type B. So let's try to take these uh, one by one. First okay. one is, uh, what if a type B program had a material weakness reported in the prior year? Would that be an automatic high-risk type B, even if you exceed the cap? I believe the UG has uh, a phrase in it that says uh, only limited items could potentially cause it to be a automatic uh, one one factor alone would not cause a uh, high risk type B program the following year and one of the things that, that you could uh, point to if the auditor said well we're going to we're not going to risk assess that one, we're going to look, risk assess other ones, is that they would still be required to do the audit follow-up related to the finding. I mean, if it was just one area, like uh, subrecipient monitoring, they knew that was the only area that was a um, causing the issue, they could they could just point to that and say, we're going to go follow up on that. We know the rest of the program is good, was good last time we audited it, so we're just going to focus in on subrecipient monitoring the following year. The, the issue becomes then is that now frees up another slot for another B to come in that you would then have to audit. And so it might be one of those things where you could justify saying, oh, we're just going to go ahead and pick that up as one of the, one of the ones that we need to meet our cap. Uh, and the nice thing about the, the UG is it also has a paragraph in there 
uh, related to auditor judgment and documentation. So it's absolutely uh, auditors must maintain documentation of the risk assessment for type A and B programs and only uh, a, a deviation would, would cause a uh, non-compliance issue to the auditor if they were subject to a quality control review and it is presumed that the auditor's judgment is correct. Now, eight, now your agent coming down, they can provide you oversight, but it's only for future um, and when they do their oversight review, they could provide you guidance that maybe there was a better approach, but that is only to be applied on future uh, major program determinations and not the uh, not the current one that, that was subject to the review. Uh, so yeah, okay. I, I would say there's a, there's a lot of room to do there, but make sure you document and, and have proper um, and you follow the UG. Right. Uh, let's stay with you, George, on uh, still more type A, type B uh, questions here. Question is this: What if you what do you do if after high risk type A and high risk type B, uh, you still need to select a grant for percentage of coverage? Do you have to perform additional risk assessments? It's my understanding you you don't because um, you're not expected to go uh, risk assess anything that is smaller than one fourth of your type A type B. Um, calculation and plus picking up those um, additional programs wouldn't provide you significant coverage because by their nature they are small and so I, you could then come back up into your B's and then grab I mean, your A's and grab one of your larger A's but for a state I, it's hard for me to envision a state that after you pick up Medicaid it probably doesn't take you very long to get to the uh, to one of the thresholds yeah. Next question, uh, similar question. Can you choose to audit a type A program with significant deficiencies? Can that program be considered high risk under the UG? Nope. Yeah. And because unless it's been two years since you last looked at it. And so you would need a, a modified opinion, question cost, the greater, I mean, it's the whole things in my assumption things. You know, there's a whole laundry list of items, uh, question costs are greater than 5%, modified opinion, uh, substantial changes in employees, the personnel, the feds or the pass-through entity has come down and found something wrong, but you can no longer use inherent risk or auditor judgment to make a type A program a, um, a, major, a type A program, a major program, unless you need it for um, audit coverage. Right, no coverage. coverage. Uh, somebody also asked, do we, do we even need to do a risk assessment on Medicaid or is it deemed high risk uh, for permanently, really, it, it, from this it, point forward? Yeah, I, I know in our office it's an automatic and so I just cite the compliance supplement that OMB has said we need to audit it and just move on from there. Yep. Uh, Doug and Shirley, let me come back to you. Uh, this question says, are states expected to amend all of their subrecipient contracts to clearly state that the UG is now in effect? And if so, has, has there been any analysis, have you done any analysis in Maine to determine what the administrative cost burden might be to conduct that exercise? To my knowledge, there's no requirement for us to go back and amend all of those contracts. Um, so we know we have not done a cost analysis for that. Uh, again, what we need to do is if we have incremental funding that somehow in the communication of that incremental funding we provide the, that guidance. Um, again, there's no, there, there isn't a required form of contract for a subrecipient agreement under the uniform guidance. We're working on one here in the state of Maine because we, within our accounting system, try to track that with a, a contract type document. Um, but you know, for simplification of the administrative burden, we're, we're just trying to come up with a standardized template or form so we can ensure that the information that's required actually does get sent out to the subs. So I can't imagine that there would be a requirement to go back and amend every agreement we have with a subrecipient where there isn't a required form of agreement to begin with. Yeah, very good. Uh, Doug, let me stay with you guys. Um, slide 14 mentioned uh, the DUNS number, and I think technically the, the, um, the UG has removed the DUNS number and replaced it with a unique identifier. 
Um, but I think, uh, and you guys weigh in on this, uh, the SAM system for practical purposes is still accepting uh, the DUNS number, and that is still the number from a practical standpoint on programs. Is, is that correct? Yes, practically speaking, that SAMS is, SAM is still relying on that DUNS number. We're still using that DUNS number. Um, there are other federal award ID numbers or subrecipient ID numbers that may be necessary, but to the extent that we have those, it's a it's a clear identifier uh, for that subrecipient. Yeah, and that, that was my understanding too. And and it, uh, another point of confusion is some people are confusing this unique identifier with the FANE number, which is the federal board identification number. Those are not the same, uh, so so don't be confused by that as well. Uh, George, uh, next question from the audience. Can you please speak more about the requirement to test compliance if the program has a material effect on the financial statements? Uh, you know, what, what is the standard for this? I think it's, I'm um, doing this from memory, I think it's like AUC um, like 935 or 915 on compliance, mm -hmm. uh, where if, uh, so for example, um, the our Edu our Department of Education uh, takes a billion dollars from the feds and then subawards it out uh, to subrecipients. That would be at the, the local LEAs, the local education agencies. And um, so when the state takes the, that funding and then passes it through uh, down to the LEAs, well, the state is signing on the dotted line for that money and then passing it down, which if the if their um, subrecipient monitoring process isn't working, I'll give you a hint, a billion dollars is a big number to our financial statements, potentially there could be a liability sitting on the financial statements that was undiscovered because they failed to review the uh, single audit reports, see how they're spending the money, do their site visits, do their communication of expectations, kind of like what, what uh, Doug was talking about in the, those are granting documents. So even if uh, one of our, there's four type A programs that are uh, go through our uh, Department of Education and it is material to our CAFR. Even when it's not a major program, we will still test uh, subrecipient monitoring at the Department of Education because that billion dollars that they're signing on the line, it has a lot of strings attached, is material to our CAFR and so we feel like in order to gain assurance that there's not a liability associated with that revenue stream that hasn't been discovered, we need to make sure that the subrecipient monitoring is working in the years that it's not picked up as a major program. Uh, but as far as the other ones, the the the, the um, like allowable cost and allowable cost activities, uh, they they don't keep a material. They don't keep more than five percent as administrative uh, funds when they pass the funds down. So even if that was all wrong, in theory, it wouldn't have a direct and material impact on the program. And so we don't look at those items or the re federal reporting or any of the other ones. But in the, in, the, in the years that it's not a major program, we do test subrecipient monitoring. All right. Thanks, George. Uh, Doug and Shirley, let me come back to you. You, you guys talked a uh, time on the change in the terminology vendor, which changed, of course, to contractors. Uh, the question is this, can states continue to award quote unquote contracts to entities that are treated as subrecipients now uh, that the guidance eliminates the term vendor in favor of contractor? Can states c continue to do that? The agreement the contract. Yeah, yes, the states can provide subawards using any form of legal agreement which includes contracts provided that those agreements comply with the standards under the guidance for subawards, both managing and auditing the award. Again, they, as I mentioned before, they don't speak directly to the form of the agreement that's necessary. It's the content of the agreement um, and that it includes the guidance relevant to subawards. Back to the right. importance Thanks. of the distinction between contractors and subrecipients. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, Doug and Shirley, let me stay with you, but the question is around timing, uh, and, and I know there's been a lot of questions about the applicable time period and the grants that are subject to the UG, but uh, for example, uh, should applications submitted before the 12-26-2014 for awards not issued until after uh, December 26, 2014 reflect the new guidance? 
In other words, we submitted our grant application before the UG became effective, but we didn't get our award until after. Is the UG actually uh, in, in effect at that point? Yes, if, if the award is made after the effective date of the uniform guidance, if, if an award is made after 12-26-2014, it's subject to the new guidance. And so the key there is when the award is actually made. And the, and the federal agency should have that in, the, in their award to the prime. They should actually have that stated that this agreement is subject to the new uniform guidance. Yeah. And I wonder, are, so, are uh, pass-through entities also making that clear to the subrecipients? They should be. Yes, I would, I would agree. And again, that's one of the challenges we faced with our agencies is clarifying which, which funding increments are subject to which um, guidance. And, and very good. Go back to the original Excellent. slide, they, they need to be notified at the time of the award. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, um, I will say I've heard word that some federal agencies, of course, no anticipating UG were com was coming down the line. They started writing their uh, grant award documents that say you have to follow um, the regulations as amended so that even though you may have received an award prior to UG, that when UG kicked in, also kicked in the requirement when they for those awards that had the uh, regulations as amended um, also would come down the pike. I don't. I only know of one limited case where that there's where that was uh, done, and I think that was through the, uh, HUD. HUD did that for a couple of its grants, or maybe all of them. But the uh, follow regulations as amended wording was starting to be used by them, and so that okay. that kind of puts a new wrinkle into it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, George. Uh, for for either of you, uh, the question is: Does the uniform guidance address distributions from the Department of Labor? A lot of silence on this end, isn't it? I'm not sure that yeah, I understand. Is. Yeah, I'm not either. I, I, maybe the question, uh, the person who submitted the question, I'm not sure what would be unique about uh, distributions from the from DOL. Right. U.S. DOL, I don't think, if, if, if I understand what they're trying to get at in the question, things related to unemployment trust, for example, mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are some different requirements around that because the state's plans um, you know, provide some flexibility in this differentiation between the states. But, but grants in general that are issued by U.S. DOL are still going to be subject to the new guidance, the, the same as uh, grants by any other federal agency. Right. I don't know exactly. of any specific exemption within that entity. Right. The important thing is to read the terms and conditions of the grant. Very good. All right. We are almost uh, to the uh, pointed hour here, but uh, George, let me wrap up with this one, and it and it pertains to smoothing. So I suspect this will probably take uh, the rest of our time, uh, which we have about three minutes, it looks like. Uh, the question is this. Uh, when do you think the Q&A will be released? During uh, regarding smoothing, that's that's the first part. Uh, do you think it will be soon enough for a state to take advantage of the opportunity for the 2016 audit? That's the second part. Uh, can you provide insight on how the auditor is going to, to be able to choose which programs they select to smooth? In other words, will they have flexibility in the ones uh, that can be chosen for the smoothing? And lastly, is Virginia proceeding as if smoothing will in fact be allowed? Oh wow, good good lineup there. Make sure I, I, I catch them all. Uh, as far oh, as yeah. the FAQ, I don't think that one's going to be out in time. From what I hear, it's coming out in the fall. I believe October was the date. And so if you are got to get your single audit done within nine months after fiscal year end, and you're at 630, that doesn't leave you much time to pick up any other major type A programs. Uh, that was one of them. As far as auditors' flexibility is picking up which programs, uh, I believe the uh, solution offered up to OMB would be allowed to allow to allow auditors to pick up and pull programs forward a year that were low risk type A. So, in other words, if if they weren't going to come, if they were automatically going to become high risk in year three, you could either move them into 17 or into 16, but if all of a sudden you had ended up with a material weakness by some case, then 
it would know you would then pick it up again as a major program the following year. Um, it also prevents auditors from trying to move around their high risk type A program. So it was only limited to allowing flexibility with low risk uh, type A programs and auditing them as um, when at the auditor's discretion in the first three years of implementation. And uh, as far as Virginia, we believe um, that uh, if we were not to do it, we wouldn't pass the prudent person test because uh, if we kind of hold back all the way to the very end uh, until 2018 and then do a, uh, a massive uh, training up of staff and do everything, that would be an additional cost. And so actually by doing them earlier, we're going to be able to ensure higher quality, which as you know, is a CPA that follows uh, uh, the yellow book are required to, to keep the public interest in mind. So I feel like the public will, will have a lower cost overall over three years and potentially, not to say we would do poor quality if we had to do it all in 18, but there's a higher chance if we maintain that consistent uh, work in our office and the expertise. So yes, a long story short is we are moving forward as if uh, smoothing is allowed in all our planning documents and staffing for next year. Yeah, and I, I think you covered all the points, uh, George. I would just add, uh, I think you're absolutely right. It's our understanding that this uh, would be addressed in an FAQ late, later this fall. But George mentioned in one of his slides that there, there has been a letter prepared and sent to OMB prepared by the State Auditors Association asking this topic to be addressed sooner than that because we, if, if auditors are going to be allowed to smooth, they need to, be, they need to be given that flexibility now as they select major programs for 2016. So uh, I do know that letter is with OMB. I do know that they are looking at it. I, I believe uh, they are going to run that past uh, the COFAR, uh, which, which looks and examines at these various issues, and if approved, uh, I, I think OMB will try to communicate that out uh, faster than the FAQ. We, we really try to stress that September or October is really too late to be able to get the benefit of, of major program smoothing. So I guess my message is uh, stay tuned and if we can get that out to, uh, if we can get approval from OMB and the COFAR, then we'll certainly get that communication out to everybody as quickly as possible. All right, um, I think we covered just about all the questions in the queue. Um, I'm looking one more time, yep, I think, uh, think we're covered. So let's go ahead and wrap up. Um, that, that concludes our webinar on Uniform Grant Guidelines, Implementation Issues for Management and Auditors. I really want to thank Doug and Shirley and George again for sharing their knowledge and experience with us today. I think they, uh, both sets of speakers gave you some practical tools and documents that you can take back and hopefully use uh, as you implement these, uh, these uniform grant guidelines. Uh, also, many thanks to Anna Penniston of the NASAC staff who helped make today's event possible. And just as a reminder, uh, for those of you wishing to claim CPE for today's training event, uh, don't forget to complete and send your CPE forms and the group sign-in sheet to NASAC. The information is listed at the bottom of your group sign-in sheet and the individual CPE form. And also, as I mentioned earlier, please note the requirement that each group location appoint a room monitor to observe attendance and verify the accuracy of the CPE forms. And please make sure that your room monitor signs the attendance record. For those attending individual, and again, there's, there's quite a few of you today, please respond to the final attendance check that appears on your screen now. You should be able to see that. Uh, simply type in, I have completed the webinar, uh, in the questions toolbar, and once you've typed that in, please hit send uh, after typing your response. Again, all of these uh, tests help us comply with the, the requirements from the National State Boards of Accountancy for granting CPE credits. And one last thing, uh, today we are using an electronic evaluation form in an effort to make our processes more efficient. Room monitors, if you would please, make sure you provide the link to the evaluation form to everyone uh, in your group. And those participating as individuals, you should have received the link to the evaluation form directly. I hope everyone enjoyed today's webinar. Obviously with the attendance we have, there's still a lot of practical implementation issues surrounding the uniform guidance. Uh, NASAC and NASC and NSAA will continue to keep you apprised 
of developments as, as uh, issues are brought to our attention. Uh, in terms of future events, just really quickly, NASAC's next webinar is scheduled for July 13th. We'll be covering our annual GASB review, uh, GASB review 2016. More details will be coming very soon to NASAC's website, which is www.nasacnasact.org. Uh, the Local Government Auditors Association is hosting its next webinar on June 21st on looking for trouble in all the right places, how to think about scoping and planning an audit. If that's of interest to you, more information can be located on ALGA's website, which is ALGA, A-L-G-A, online.org, uh, ALGA, online, one word, dot org. Our colleagues at AGA, their next webinar will be on June the 1st. The topic will be the importance of change management in federal shared services. Uh, if you're interested in that topic, more details are, can be found at AGA's website, which is agacgfm.org. Please go there for more details. Again, I want to thank everybody for participating today. Thank you for the great questions that we received from the audience, and have a great afternoon.